you are listening to, I say you are listening to, you are absolutely listening to, The George Esperin Love Show, coming to you live from the funny farm. Now with no further ado, here comes Georgie! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) If you hear these little bells and one of those things going off, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) excuse me, it's it's because this thing beside me is blowing up. Uh, Anyhow, I want to say thank you. This is Monday night. And you are listening to the George Esperlove Show live from the Funny Farm in a place called Our World. We call it Our World because, well, we're the ones that live here. And we don't have a tangible address. We never did. We don't. And we never will. We just live here, and we're happy to be living here. And we thank you for tuning in tonight. It's been a while since we've been strictly on the radio But here we are, we're back, strictly on the radio, and I am delighted to be with you this Monday night. So whether you're down the street, and you'll have to excuse me because I still can't get over this cold, (coughs) Uh, I can't get over this cough, but nonetheless, whether you're down the street, around the corner, across America, or somewhere around this great big world, I'm so delighted that you could take the time to drop in and spend the evening with us. We have two goals in mind here at the Funny Farm. Number one, I don't know what trials and tribulations you're going through. I don't know what dark days or how many dark days that you face. I don't know how dark and deep the valley is. But if we can bring a smile to your face... If it's just for a few seconds, we'll be happy. Our other goal around here is simply to make you as goofy (laughs) as the rest of us. Now, there are many people that have come to the Funny Farm. Few have left. That's just a warning. But I need to go further with that warning, and I need to tell you this. Whatever effects befall you, And you will feel them as they descend down upon you. Whatever effects come upon you, whatever effects come upon you and yours, we are not responsible for. No, we're not responsible. You have entered into the funny farm at your own risk. And I know, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, That, if you stick around long enough, you'll never be the same again. And we'll be delighted, because that's one of our goals, to make you just as goofy. (laughs) A little slow on that one, weren't you folks? To make you just as goofy as the rest of us. But seriously, we want you to sit back tonight, because we have a great program that's scheduled for you. And first of all, I want to take time to salute each and every one of our veterans, those that have served in years gone by, those that are serving now. I want to salute those that paid the ultimate price for our freedom. I want to thank each and every one of our service men and women around this world that are laying it all on the line for our freedom and for our safety. And you've heard me say over the years on this radio show, my heroes are not those that play in the sports arenas. 
My heroes are not those that are up in the big silver screen of Hollywood. No, they're not my heroes. My heroes are the men and women that put on a uniform, be it the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, the National Guard, the Coast Guard, or the Marine Corps. You put that uniform on because you wanted to serve. And you were willing to give your all. Even if it came down to the ultimate sacrifice that this country can continue to be the greatest country in the world. And you want to serve this country and protect your people. Ladies and gentlemen, I salute you. And I extend to you from the deep parts <coughs> of my being a heartfelt thank you for your service. And may God keep you right in the center of his hand. We're going to be airing Unshackled here in just a moment. And I don't know of any better account of airing Unshackled, produced and directed by Pacific Garden Mission out of Chicago, Illinois. I don't know of any other program to air tonight that could be so relevant and so needed for this Veterans Day. We're going to be airing the story of Major Chuck, Chuck Cofty, United States Marine Corps. You will hear what the man went through, what he faced when he came home, and then you also hear the end result as he stepped from darkness into life. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends, Romans, and countrymen, please lend me your ear. Sit back and enjoy old-time radio in the 21st century. Taken the credit or thanked someone else? Well, most of us have done so at least once. For years, the man in this story believed his survival in Vietnam was due to expert training and his own prowess. But he knew better the day his heart and mind and life were unshackled. This house seems secure enough, except for the canal out front. The hedge on three sides is a big help. When I did my walk around, I saw a hole in the hedge on the west side. Big enough for us to crawl through if we come under fire and have to escape. Not to worry. The Nung are on guard, and they hate commies. They fight hard and can't be bought. Same can't be said for some of the Vietnamese. How long you been in country, Chuck? Six months. I was at Phu Lok. Recruiting sources? Yep, from all walks of life. Woodcutters, priests, village chiefs, farmers, Viet Cong. Hey, anyone can be a source of counterintelligence. Do you understand Vietnamese yet? Yeah, some. Doesn't sound like Chinese, I know that. No, the Nung are ethnic Chinese. They understand both languages. And they'll stand guard all night? Yeah. Uh, there's a real bed upstairs. Grab some shut-eye. <laughs> sure beats the deck of the Okinawa or a cot in some hooch. <laughs> a cot? I thought Marines slept in the mud just for practice. Yeah, well, I've had all the practice I need. I hope they're wrong about something big coming down. But keep your weapon handy. Proclaiming the good news through true life stories of real people, this is Unshackled, dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Shame is a word rarely used these days, yet shame is something the homeless feel when they sleep in the open, forage for food in dumpsters, use public facilities in their ragged clothing. That's why Pacific Garden Mission offers them refuge, providing showers and fresh clothing, nourishing meals, and a clean, safe bunk for the night, even medical and dental treatment, and all without charge. Mission pastors and counselors share the good news of God's love and provision, offering the truth that sets them free, His sacrifice for their shame. 
And those who receive his gift receive new life, like the man in this story. And now for broadcast around the earth, here's program number 2,961 in the series Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. Man, that sounds like some hot stuff. Sounds like this is not going to be good. Anything on the radio from command post? The non-compound is under attack, and the police special branch, too. Ah, something big, all right. And getting bigger. It sounds like all of Way City is under attack. Look, I'll slip outside and see what I can see. Check those nuns outside. North Vietnamese? Yeah, they're across the canal. Going from house to house, killing people. What about the tank? All dead. Dead. Along with the tank crew guarding the bridge. Probably killed by advanced sappers. There's a big column of NVR headed this way. We better get out. Come on, let's go through that hedge. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, January 30th, 1968. And the man on our story was a Marine officer serving with the 1st Marine Division in Hue City, Vietnam. He was caught up in the biggest battle of the war, the Tet Offensive. This is the story of how that and other firefights affected him and where they ultimately led. It's the true story of Chuck Cofty right now on Unshackled. I was born at Fort Benning, Georgia. Military brat whose father retired at Provost Marshal of Fort Gordon. Both my parents taught me invaluable lessons. Mom expressed her approval, but Dad didn't. However, I learned about God and a basic belief in his existence during my early years. My dad drank heavily. I grew up with anger and fighting. I thought that was how you solved problems. I could hardly wait to get out of school so I could leave home to join the Marines. It wasn't the paradise that I had dreamed about, but I applied the stick-to-it principles taught by my parents. After basic and advanced combat training, I was assigned to the Marine Barracks at Pensacola and then Jacksonville, Florida, where I attended a dance with friends who introduced me to Lenora. She was a lady and very different from anyone I had ever met. We were drawn to each other and married in 1958, two months after we met. A year later, our first son was born, and our second one arrived 13 months after that. Then I was transferred to Paris Island, where our daughter was born. When we married, Lenora had no idea how commonplace angry outbursts and drunken brawls were to me. But she learned. Oh, what happened to you, Chuck? You're all bloody. Well, just a little fight in the bar. A little fight? Uh, you should see the other guy. Oh, what were you fighting about? Doesn't matter. Real man doesn't let an insult pass. I I hope you never treat me that way. Oh, of course not. You're, you're my wife, Lenora. My dad never got in fights. He didn't even raise his voice. Yeah, well, my dad did. Besides, your dad left when you were just a girl. He might have changed. No, he didn't change. He even used to read Bible stories to us. I'm not sure what happened to make him leave us. Well, don't you worry. I'll never leave you. Now, come on. Have a drink with me. Oh, I'd rather not. Come on, come on. I'm celebrating. Today, I signed up to become a lifer. A lifer? I re-enlisted. I'm going to make a career of the Marines. Lenora would also enlist for service. But her commander would rank higher than mine, and one day, he would call me to attention. I was transferred to Okinawa for duty with the 3rd Marine Division and separated from my family for 16 months. Lenora was a great wife and mother and had developed a great home life for our children. After a brief assignment to Albany, Georgia, I was assigned to headquarters in Washington, D.C. There I was promoted to staff sergeant and then came another promotion. Second Lieutenant Chuck, that's wonderful. You're married to an officer now, Lenora. A Mustang. Well, I hope that means no more fighting. Well, no more bar fights anyway. But that's not all, honey. What? I've been selected for counterintelligence training. Oh, it sounds dangerous, Chuck. Well, it's vital for winning wars. When I finished training in 1967, I was shipped to Vietnam for duty with the 3rd Marine Division. Spent the first six months at Phu Lok, south of Phu Bai, working with two sergeants and three interpreters. 
We provided ground counterintelligence support for the troops in an area that backed all the way up to the Ashau Valley. Then I was transferred to Hue City on the 28th of January, 1968, for a special assignment working with a cover group. I was to relieve Al, another Marine in counterintelligence. There's a briefing this morning at Arvin headquarters, Chuck. Lots of sightings and movements. Mm, that's why they issued me another weapon. Not the 9 millimeter Browning? Yeah, not my favorite. I prefer a 45. Well, I hope we get the straight skinny and not a bunch of smoke. Tell me, what do you heard, Al? Well, large movements of enemy troops in and around the Ashaw Valley. Yeah, I was up there with Lima Company searching for a POW camp. A defector told us two Americans were being held there. Charlie's living room. Huge complex. 35 bamboo buildings that we torched, but the tiger cages were empty when we got there. Yeah, they heard you were coming and moved them. Yeah, good location for POW camp. Fast-moving stream covered the noise. We didn't stick around because we were in company minus posture. Yeah, two platoons are no match for a battalion. The skipper did the right thing. Hey, we'd better get to the briefing. That morning, we were briefed at headquarters by the American advisor to the Vietnamese Army, and also by the cover group. Still nothing definite was said about the large troop movement. By the next morning, however, a group of agencies involved in various spook endeavors got together to discuss evacuation plans. Afterward, Al and I went back to the safe house to burn our source reports. Those reports are true. We're in deep kimchi, Al. Fifteen to eighteen elements of battalion size, that's a big force. Yeah, trouble is, different sources may be spotting and reporting the same units. Still, we could be overrun, and if there's no evacuation plan... Ah, there is no evacuation plan. That's why we're burning the records. Yeah, whose idea was it to evacuate by chopper at night? Ludicrous. <laughs> Man, the look on their faces when you asked them how a chopper would recognize a five-star cluster at night with gunfire <laughs> flares and mortars going off. Well, we're just a couple of jarhead CI types. What do we know about evacuation plans? Well, all I know is something bigger than usual is about to come down. The powers that be decided Al and I should not stay together in the safe house designated for the Marine representative, but that I should go and stay with two other guys, Mark and Levi, spooks for a different agency. That night, the North Vietnamese attacked in force. The start of the Tet Offensive. First, they slaughtered doctors, lawyers, and high-ranking government officials to rob the city of its leadership. We three Americans and six Nung guards escaped through the hole in the hedge. We ran through backyards and alleyways to a street that lay two blocks south of the canal. Coming to a street, we looked right and saw a large contingent of troops. We didn't dare cross the street, and we couldn't go back. So we ran to the left, toward the Perfume River where there was a single-story dwelling with a six-foot-high wall all around it. We threatened the occupants and tried to find cover. Inside, quick! We can hide in the false ceiling if we can get up there. Come on, help me push this wardrobe over. Come on! Look out the window! They're gathering by the hundreds! By the dim orange glow of the streetlights, we could see NVA troops drop their packs and lie on the ground, maybe 40 yards away. We're up to our necks in Charlie's, trapped. Four of them passed by the jealousy windows close enough to touch. Suddenly, one of them kicked open the back door and and Mark fired. I, I stepped to the door and dusted three more. In a moment, we'll hear the outcome of this tense and dangerous situation. Unshackled is broadcast around the world in eight languages and can be heard at some time just about anywhere. So if you have friends or family living in some far-off place, or if you're moving or traveling, you can know when and where this program is broadcast. Simply write and request our radio station guide, and we'll send you a free copy. Specify whether you want the domestic guide or the international one. Either one details the location, call letters, frequency, language, day of the week, and time of the day that Unshackled is broadcast. And you can also visit our website, unshackled.org, and click on the radio log. There you will find the most up-to-date details. For more information, write to Pacific Garden Mission, Chicago, Illinois, 60605. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org, and please include your address. 
My flak jacket protected me when the RPG exploded in the front of the house, sending shrapnel in all directions. My wounds were superficial, but some of the Nung guards were killed. We finished off the enemy forces in our area, and the main force of the NVA didn't seem to know where the shots were coming from in the noise of battle, so Mark and I escaped and evaded them. We encountered some NVA and had a fierce firefight. Somehow, Mark's femur was wounded after we moved from the house. How's the leg? Painful. At least we're safe for the time being. Look, they're digging bunkers on the far side of the canal. Uh-huh, so they can ambush our troops. Man, I wish we had a radio to report their position. I'd call in artillery. I wish I had my canteen. Yeah, me too. Stoop. Me, I dismantled my gear and left them behind in the safe. Listen, our guys are still fighting. Hope they find us before the NVA do. We moved several times, holding up for a few days until the need for water drove us out. We found some South Vietnamese in one bunker who gave us water and begged us to leave so the NVA wouldn't kill their whole family. We crossed a small alley to the Chinese Institute of Learning, where we snapped a lock in back and made our way to the second floor. Enemy troops were all over the grounds, so we hid on a stairway to the outside, only a few steps from certain capture or death. In the morning, we heard a firefight and mortars, and the NVA patrols were stealthily retreating to the canal. Mark and I slipped to the outside of the stairway, ready to move on. I hear M-16s. Yeah, I think the Marines are pushing our way. That's why Charlie's been sneaking back all morning. Look, 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 the patrols are retreating across the bridge. Put those hands up. I'm not telling you again. A Marine! Hey, we're Americans! Hey. Put down your weapons and put your hands on your head. Okay, okay, but, but we're Americans. We've been hiding from the bad guys. Yeah, I'll let the captain sort that out. Now start walking. This was eight days after the battle for Hue had begun, and we'd been living on the run. Both of us had on torn and bloody civilian clothes, so he thought we were Russian spies or Czech advisors. He escorted us at gunpoint to his command post, set up in a large house along the Perfume River. Well, you guys were reported as missing in action. By all rights, you should be dead. Yeah, we had some close calls, but we made it through. What happened to Levi? A Vietnamese source told us they saw him being led away with his hands on his head. Any word on Al? Uh, missing in action. Probably captured. His safe house was overrun. Oh, man. Now, tell us how you escaped. Uh, first, we need to call in artillery. We saw the NVA building bunkers along the canal. Sergeant, get on the radio and call in the coordinates they give you. The battalion ordered artillery fire from Fubai and from naval guns on ships sitting off the coast. We were then taken to another compound, where we spent the night before being evacuated to a medical facility. I spent three days in the hospital before going back to duty to finish my tour. Lenora had been in a different kind of battle while I was away, but she was captured. I noticed the subtle changes, but we didn't talk about it. After some time at home, I had an abbreviated time in Vietnam in 1970, and then returned home again. This time, the change in Lenora was very distinct. I heard a passionate message on heaven and hell as a child that I never forgot. Fear gripped my heart throughout the years so often as I thought about our marriage and my death. I turned to God. I attended a lady's Bible study where I realized that I needed to be saved. A lady that radiated God's presence and a passion for my soul showed me from the Bible how I could be saved. She led me to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I got down on my knees and repented of my sins, and I asked God to save me. He did. That was 1969. I became a fanatic and told everyone of this great salvation. But when Chuck returned from Vietnam, I prayed and waited for God to use the change in me to draw him to salvation. 
Honey, it's so good to have you back home, safe and sound. I had some close calls. Oh, the Lord was with you. So were a few good buddies who sacrificed their lives to protect me. Well, whoever God used, he's the reason that you're still alive. I'm glad that he did. Does it seem strange to be home again? Does it ever. We, we dream about being back in the real world, and now it seems unreal over here. But hey, let's, let's celebrate tonight. I want to dance the night away and forget the war. Um... I can't do some of the things I used to do with you, Chuck. What do you mean? Well, go to bars and drink. I... Well, 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 why not? Well, I'd, I've been attending a Bible study and reading the Bible for myself. I attend a small church, too, and I've learned that we should live differently, not like the world. Wait, wait. I, I went to church growing up, Lenora. So did I, but I never felt close to God, even though I wanted to be. I want the kids to know the Lord, Chuck, so I've been going to church every week. That's hooey. It's all a bunch of rules and lies. Hypocrites. Now, look, I don't want to be married to a religious woman. I love the Lord, and I love you, too. Won't you give Jesus a chance? Our marriage went through horrific turmoil, and Chuck's new assignment demanded more of him, so he gave up drinking. But it didn't last. I wanted to be obedient to the Lord, so I tried to do what Chuck wanted. Lenora was so different. I, I didn't know if I'd stay in the marriage or not. I, I was very indifferent to her by this time and to my children. However, I, I could feel a presence that I didn't understand when she talked with me about God. By then, I was commander of the 6th Counterintelligence Team stationed in Southern California. When the American POWs were released from North Vietnam in 1973, we were assigned to Operation Homecoming at the Naval Hospital in Oakland. We debriefed the returning POWs, and that's when I learned that Al had died of his wounds on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and Levi spent five years as a POW. I accompanied a senior Marine officer to his home where his wife lived with another man. Spent five years in Hanoi Hilton, dreaming of the day I'd come home and be with my wife and children. It's a long time, sir. I've kept in shape by doing a hundred push-ups a day in my cell. Considering the food rations, that's an achievement. The food they gave us wasn't even fit for animals. You know, debriefing you guys, listening to all your stories, just makes me so angry. They, they should have let us hammer Hanoi. At least I survived. Hope of returning to my wife and children is what kept me going. I just couldn't give up. Well, here we are, sir. <laughs> what kind of home is it now? An empty shell. She's gone living with someone else. She took the kids with her. What was the point of it all? What am I going to do? I never saw a man so broken. I accompanied him to the storage unit as he gave away expensive and invaluable memoirs that had no meaning now. I saw that situation played out numerous times. I watched as men who had been strong in battle began to melt like hot wax before my eyes. It was more than I could handle. Why had I been spared the same pain? My marriage was intact, while personally and emotionally I, I was almost over the edge. I returned home on the 4th of June, 1973, a broken man. I made coffee for you, Chuck. I don't want any. Don't you want breakfast before you go to work? I'm not going. What's wrong? I can't do it, Lenora. I, I just can't do it anymore. Honey, what is it? Those brave men. It's, it's horrible hearing what they had to go through as prisoners of war. I'm sure it was. Yeah, you can't imagine. You fought your own battles, Chuck. Yeah, but I was never a POW. I saw those tiger cages, the, the cave where they kept Americans. They captured you. could smell death everywhere. Come on, Chuck. Take a walk with me. The exercise will be good for you. Lord, he needs you so much. Open his eyes, dear God. Choke him down to parade rest. He won't go easy. Please save him, Father. Draw him to you and save him. I wept all day on the 4th, 5th, and 6th of June... Lenora was there to comfort me. She stayed by my side and loved me. 
I just knew I was having a nervous breakdown, but Lenora knew that God was dealing with my wicked and prideful heart. On the evening of the 6th, I made a decision. Where are you going? To the hospital. I'm going to see a head doctor. Why? I'm falling apart, Lenora. I need help. You don't need a doctor, Chuck. You need the Lord. Lenora. Come sit down beside me and ask God to forgive you for the rotten way you've lived. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Tell God that you repent of your sins. Then ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Jesus fought the greatest battle of all for your soul. He gave his life so that you could have a new life. Don't reject this great sacrifice. God loves you, and he wants you to become his child. He will save you, and the battle will be over. For once, I listened to my wife. She led me to the throne of God that Wednesday afternoon. I prayed, as she said, and God saved me. As his spirit sealed and healed my broken heart, I wept. Oh, the peace I felt couldn't be conveyed with words. On Sunday, I went with her to that little church she'd been attending for two years. I had no idea that they'd been praying for me all that time. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. He didn't say he was a way or one of many ways. He said, I am the way. There is no other way to God the Father except through Jesus Christ the Son. In John chapter 10, he describes himself as the door of the sheepfold, saying, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. You have freedom in Christ because he paid your sin debt. When you are in Christ, the enemy of your soul cannot badger you with shame and regret. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. If you would like to have freedom from the law of sin and death, come forward and give your life to Jesus. It's time. Time for what? To go down to the front and tell everyone that you got saved on Wednesday. How do you do it? Just step out and walk down there. As a Marine, I knew that we followed orders. We did things correctly in the Corps. So I marched down to the front, stopped at the pulpit, popped my heels together, and stood at attention. What have you come down for, Mr. Cofty? My wife told me to. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I... I've already received Christ as my Savior. Last Wednesday. That's wonderful. Three men came up first and embraced me, and that was something I hadn't done before, but God showed me how they cared and loved me. Right away, I lost three-quarters of my vocabulary. No more cursing. Quit drinking, soon quit smoking, too. I became a fanatic also because Jesus inducted me into the army of God, and I am his foot soldier. About a year and a half after I was saved, God spoke to my heart about full-time ministry. I retired from the Marine Corps in 1979 after 22 years of service, went to Bible school, served as a pastor in Decatur, Alabama until 1986 when I resigned to become an evangelist, which I love. I not only get to preach the gospel of Jesus, but I get to encourage young and struggling pastors. I've been married for 49 years, and God raised us godly seeds in our children. I've been traveling now for 23 years with the same message of hope for all who live in despair. Jesus will set you free. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved.
That message of redemption is for you, listening friend. The Prince of Peace came to give you life and life more abundantly. To receive God's gift of eternal life, hear the words of the Lord. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. If you need counsel in making this life-changing decision for Christ, just get in touch with Pacific Garden Mission, Chicago, Illinois, 60605. The telephone number in Chicago, area 312-922-1462. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Visit our website to learn more about this ministry, unshackled.org. This is program number 2,961. Unshackled is produced by Pacific Garden Mission to show through true stories that if your life is empty, it can be filled to overflowing. Please write today. Your letter means a great deal to us. The address, Pacific Garden Mission, Chicago, Illinois, 60605. You may call Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago and talk with someone who cares, 312 9221462 9221462 someone is waiting for your call 3129221462 And I hope that you enjoyed tonight's show, Unshackled, Major Chuck Cofty and his story. Several years ago, we had Major Cofty on this radio program. I guess it was seven, eight years ago, somewhere around there. (coughs) And he was still full-time ministry, preaching the gospel, evangelizing, reaching out, touching people, and doing what he was called to do. One more time before we leave tonight, I want to say thank you to the veterans that have served and to those that are serving today. Thank you. Thank you from the depths of my heart. Thank you from a nation. Because of you, we are free and we are safe. I want to challenge you to be with us tomorrow night at 8 p.m. We'll be running a Tuesday night show. We'll probably be live streaming again, but we're going to have Anthony Griggs with us. He was scheduled to be with us last week, and we had some problems with the scheduling. So he will be with us tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on the George Espinlob Show. Anthony is a former linebacker. For the Philadelphia Eagles, Cleveland Browns, he later moved on to the Steelers where he became the conditioning coach for a number of years. He is active in the NFL Player Association. He is part of the alumni there. Uh, He is a keynote speaker, and he does multiple things of helping young men transition from football out here into the real world amongst other things and tomorrow night he'll be sharing those things with you a great individual a man that is energized and his his energy is contagious trust me he will fire you up 
Uh, he will talk. He will be talking to us about uh, a multitude of things. So join me tomorrow night as Anthony Griggs comes on to the George Espen Love Show at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and we will no doubt be live streaming that show. So you'll not only hear Anthony, but you'll get to see him. It has been a tremendous, tremendous day, and I thank each and every one of you for taking the time to come in, be with us, and out of your busy schedule, you were so kind just to come in and be part of this show. I thank you for it. Listen, we can be heard on iHeartRadio, Spotify, VIP Network, which is, I think, some 120 stations. Uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, it, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Thank you for all of your support. Thank you for your love. If you know of someone that wasn't able to join us tonight as we air this live program, please tell them that they can come back right here, Spreaker.com, and download the show or... Just sit back and listen to it all over again. Let them know that we'll be on tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, right here, one more time. And so for those that are down the street, around the corner, somewhere across America, and around this great big world, thank you for tuning in tonight. I trust that you will have a pleasant night. If it's nighttime where you are at, I hope that you'll have a great day if it's already daytime wherever you're at. But regardless of what it is and where you're at, for me and all the gang here at the Funny Farm, we say thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for your kind words. And our hope is. God will keep you right in the center of his hand. So until tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, this is George Espinwab thanking you for tuning in. And may God bless you real good. Good night, everybody.